As is our custom here at La Sierra, please stand for the reading of the word. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 1, um, starting with verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of God. You may be seated. This morning, we're going to focus on four words that Jesus says to his followers just as he's taken up. These, um, these few words, um, you, it's actually five words, you will be my witnesses. We're gonna pause four times to consider this phrase, you will be my witnesses. First of all, you, who exactly is Jesus talking to in this moment when he's going up to heaven and he says, you will be my witnesses? Disciples, I heard disciples, all right. Very good. So Christians have imagined this scene, what would it have been like for centuries? The very first account that we have of this scene is from 400 CE, 400 years after Christ. Um, and it's in ivory. You can see a picture of it here. This is an ivory relief that would have been created for someone's burial. And you see in this picture, you see Jesus is going up. I love this ancient artwork of Jesus holding God's hand. Isn't that cool? Going up, holding God's hand. And you see the followers of Jesus, and they really don't know what's going on there. Um, there's not a set number of them. They're kind of going different directions. The women are there at the bottom trying to figure it out. And, and then there's, some people are looking down. Some people are, are looking up. This is the first Christian account that we have in art. Of the, of the ascension. A few years after that, in 586, there's the Rubula Gospels, and this is an illustrated manuscript. So a lot of early Christian artwork that we have comes from scribes that would copy the Bible, copy the Gospels again and again, and in, they, would, they would make it ornate. It would be a piece of artwork. And in the manuscript of the, of the Rubula Gospels, named for the scribe that that created that gospel in, in Syria, we see this picture of Jesus ascending and there are the apostles and who's in the very middle, um, at the bottom in the middle, any guesses? It's, it's Mary, Jesus' mother. So this artist thought, I could not imagine Jesus leaving earth without his mother being there to say goodbye. I couldn't imagine it. So there's, there's Mary, uh, Jesus' mother in the middle of that scene. Then in 850, in the Drogo Sacramentary, this would have been a book of prayers that the bishop would have used every week as, as, as he led prayers. It's a manuscript on velum, which is a fancy word for a, a document made from calf leather, basically, velum. And so this is so ornate. And again, notice the hand. Jesus is going up, he's reaching the hand to, to, to God there, going up. Um, and the others are just kind of wondering, you know, what's happening. And I think, again, Mary is there. The next one I have to share with you is from Germany. It's from the book of Revelation. Again, an artwork within the book. Um, and I love this one because at the bottom is not just 11 disciples or 11 plus Mary, but a whole group of followers of Jesus that are there and included in that moment and looking up at Jesus. Um, then one from 1513, this is from an altar in Germany by an artist named, named Kulmbach. Um, and here we see something that started developing an artwork, which is interesting. Just Jesus' feet are showing. Just the feet. This was a common way of sharing the ascension for a while. Just his feet. And there at the bottom you have Mary, of course. How could we leave out Jesus' mother? 
Um, and then you have 12 apostles, even though in the text, we, have, we don't have a 12th apostle yet in this moment um, when Jesus is going up to heaven. Um, but I think it's a symbolic of 12, the completeness of the church that's seeing Jesus off um, just as feet are going up there. The same time period, 1550 in Italy by Doso Dosi. He has kind of a stylized Jesus, the conquering king with the flag, and the disciples, 11 this time, plus Mary. We can't leave out Jesus' mother for this moment. This final one I'm gonna show you um, is from 400 years later. I'm a Welsh painter. This is in the mid um, 20th century. Evan Walters, he's, a, he's from Wales. And I love this view of the ascension because it focuses in on the faces of the people left behind. Who are they? When Jesus says you, who is he talking to? Who are, who are they? Who are they from Acts 1 verse 6? When it says, so when they had come together in this moment, who are they? So when you read in the Bible, many of you know that if it says they, you got to read a little bit further up. Who are they? Who is it talking to? So we go to the beginning of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 verse 1, it starts out. In the first book, Theophilus, what's the first book? Luke, where were we just at for a few weeks? Luke, this is a two-part series. Luke was part one to Theophilus, Acts is part two to Theophilus. So he starts, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. The apostles. Is you then the 11 remaining apostles? Is that who was at in this moment? Is that who were asked to be witnesses? Are, are those, that would seem the obvious thing, the apostles. That's the first, that's the last reference before they, all right, the apostles. But since this is a two-part series, let's go back to the end of the book of Luke for a minute before we continue in Acts. And in Luke chapter 24, we see these appearances of Jesus to his followers. First, in chapter 24 and verse 8 to 9, it says, Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Notice, the eleven and all the rest. All right. And next, the next verse is going to tell us who they were that told them. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. In the Gospel of Luke, there is a whole community of women who are journeying with Jesus to Jerusalem. They're helping him from their finances. You can read about them in Luke chapter eight. They are providing for him. They've been healed. Uh, Mary Magdalene has been delivered from seven spirits. And they are, they are close to Jesus. They are part of his community. They're traveling with him. And they're the ones who first see the two men that tell, tell them that Jesus is risen. They go to the apostles and they don't believe them. Then another two are met by Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, there are two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They're walking along. Jesus walks beside them. He opens the scriptures to them. And it's when that they get to the house and they're breaking bread and Jesus blesses the bread and the grape juice where their eyes are open. And they said, this is Jesus. And they run all the way back to Jerusalem. Um, and the text says, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together, right? So when it says the apostles, we see in Luke, it's the apostles and their companions that are together. What happened in that moment? Jesus appears. It says, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. How would you feel if you suddenly saw Jesus in the room? 
Ever felt startled and terrified by something that God has done, by a way that God showed up? I love this, the honesty of this reaction, startled and terrified. A few verses down, it describes, it says, for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. Do you ever feel like that's where you're at in the community of Jesus? Disbelieving and wondering at the same time? And Jesus said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. This is a wonderful verse for all of you who want to eat fish. <laughs> right? Jesus is post-resurrection, eating fish. Maybe this is some hope for you all in heaven. I don't know. The resurrected Christ ate fish to prove that he was human, that he was not just a ghost, that not just a spirit, that he had a physical body. He had a physical body. And so then what does he do? In that room, not just with the 11 apostles, but with all those women, with the companions, with the ones that had come to tell them, the disciples from Emmaus, with everyone in the room, Jesus says to them, you are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The same words at the end of Luke, as Jesus says in the beginning of Acts, you are my witnesses. It includes not just the 11, it includes the whole community of followers of Jesus. They're all gathered there together. And back to Acts, just to show you a little bit more why I believe they includes more than just the 11. In Acts 1 verse 13, it describes who was it that followed those last instructions of Jesus. When Jesus' feet are going up into the clouds and he says, you're gonna be my witnesses, but wait in Jerusalem, who follows the instructions? Well. Acts 1 verse 13 says, when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. You might say, ah, the 11 apostles. And more. The next verse, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. It's so beautiful to me in the book of Acts that we find that Jesus' brothers, the one where Jesus had said, hey, the, my brothers and my, my family, my mother are the ones that do my will. You all are a little crazy. You think I'm crazy. You wanna try to take me home. In the end, Jesus' brothers believe in him and they're part of the community. They're included in the they that are his witnesses. And who else? The very next verse. What happens on that day? It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and the sisters. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons. 120. So who is part of the they? The 12. The 11 plus the one that came into that circle, that close circle. The women that followed Jesus from Jerusalem. Jesus' brothers that denied him and didn't want to be a part of what he was doing, were embarrassed by him. Jesus' brothers are part of that. And 120 people. In the Bible, numbers are very significant. Very significant. Why were the disciples so worried about replacing Judas? They only had 11. Why? Because Jesus intentionally had chosen 12 to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the leaders of Israel. Why 120? You are not just the 12, you include the 120. This is a new Israel. Instead of a geographical, physical Israel, an ethnic Israel, now the new Israel is all those who want to be a part of the community, all those who accept that Jesus is the King of Israel, that Jesus is the Messiah, are part of this spiritual, spiritual Israel. That's why there are 120 mentions, part of this Israel community. You include the 12, the 120, and guess what? You include you and me too. 
includes all of us as part of the kingdom, as part of this new Israel that Jesus is forming, that, that are responding to Jesus' spirit. And guess what? You include the startled and terrified, the disbelieving and wondering, we're all part of it. You will be my witnesses. You, all of us, no matter your age, no matter your ethnicity, no matter your background, no matter if you've been in this church for five generations or you walked in this morning, you will be my witnesses. The next part of that phrase I wanna focus on, you will be my witnesses. It's a process, it's a process. Who are you today that you never dreamed you would be? Who are you today? A baker, a runner, a teacher, a doctor, a husband, a parent, a grandparent? Who are you today that you never dreamed that you would be? I have to tell you, as I stand on this platform today, I'm gonna to show you a picture. Um, this is my sister and me and my grandparents, who many of you have met and heard my stories about, my grandfather, the one I wrote the book about in Grandpa's Shoes. This is us having family worship and in that moment, I could not have dreamed that one day I would speak about Jesus from a platform like this. I couldn't have dreamed it. Couldn't have dreamed it. And guess what? My sister, um, she got a call recently to go be a lead pastor in Reno, Nevada, along with her husband, um, Pastor Kevin Solomon, who's pastoring a neighboring church. They're so excited that they can both lead churches about 15 minutes apart from each other. Could we ever have imagined that in that moment? And yet, the daily moments of getting to know Jesus is the formation of you will be my witnesses. It's a process, it's a journey. We can't imagine what it'll be like five years from now, 10 years from now. Who am I gonna be? Who are you gonna be? It's a process and as we stick with Jesus, we get more and more formed into his followers, more and more formed into his disciples. And who you are 10 years from now will not be the same as who you are in this moment if you stick with Jesus. You will be my witnesses. The next word, my, my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. This is a great word, the next one here, mine. Desmond loves this word right now. <laughs> he is a little over one and a half. His birthday's in July, he'll be two. He's using this word a lot lately. I mean, he goes up and he says, you know, Aga, that's his word for Eric, he says Aga's water bottle, okay? He loves taking things to people that they belong to them. So from several months ago, he would take something and give it to the person, but he's doing something new. He gives it and then he says, no mine. He's getting really good at that word, mine. And we had such a fun time, uh, Four Days with Jesus, at our, our breakfast last week. Very first time he could really get the concept of an egg hunt. Um, and it was so fun to watch the littles. They were kind of standing bewildered, and all of a sudden they thought, aha, I get to make all those things mine. This is great. This is fun. I would go around and that's mine, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. And isn't that what we do at this age? What does my mean? My mean, it belongs to me. And so when Jesus says, you are my witnesses, Jesus is saying, guess what? You belong to me, you are mine. You are my, my witnesses. And what does this look like? This is why Jesus told them, don't run off. Don't run off to tell everyone this news. Stay in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What is this about the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is God filling us and saying, mine. You are mine. I want to know, before you run off trying to tell anyone anything else, I want us to know that you are mine. 
That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we see it described the next chapter in Acts chapter 2 and one verse starting with verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, this was 50 days after um, the resurrection, 50 days later, and Israel at that time celebrated the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. The day of Pentecost, when it came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Have you ever seen fire on someone's head? I have to admit, I've been in a lot of church gatherings and I have not witnessed fire on someone's head. I have not seen that happen, but guess what? I have seen people's lives and their faces and their whole countenance transformed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So why is there fire? If we don't see fire today, why does Luke describe fire in this moment? I believe it's this this inauguration again of the new Israel. When does Israel start at the first Pentecost on Mount Sinai? What comes down from heaven? Wind, thunder, lightning, fire. God makes a covenant, a promise, a sealing of God and God's people, Israel. And in this moment, Fire comes down on the 120, the, the new members of this community of Israel, and God says, you are mine. What else does it mean? When else does fire come down? Well, in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 1, we see this amazing moment of Solomon's temple. What happens when a temple gets dedicated? When Solomon ended his prayer, it says, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Friends, where is God's temple today? Here and here and here and here and back there and back there and over there and over there. In the Bible, it says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Together, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down, there's fire to say the temple is no longer the temple in Jerusalem that's gonna be destroyed. The temple is the community. You are God's temple. You belong to me. I'm filling you with the Holy Spirit. You are mine. So today, God wants to remind us that when Jesus says, you are my witnesses, focus first in being filled with God's presence, knowing that God is with you, knowing that you are listening to the Holy Spirit to know the direction that God would have you to go. You are mine. There's another reason, there's another meaning to my witnesses. So first, my witnesses means you belong to me. You belong to me, you are mine. But the second meaning of my, my witnesses, is connected to the, the next thing I want to focus on there is you point to me. You belong to me, you're my witnesses, and you are my witnesses. <laughs> you're pointing people back to me pointing back, back to me, and what do we see? We see that was the preaching of the early church in Acts chapter two. Peter says, this Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. What was the focus of their witness? Jesus, Jesus. It wasn't about their church or their community. They were witnesses of Jesus. That was their focus. You are my witnesses. You belong to me. You point to me. It's easy for us to get distracted. Remember the question that they first asked in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7? Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? We all want to know the dates, don't we? Is this the moment? Is this the time? They were distracted. Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or periods the Father has sent by my, his own authority. There are things that you will not know. 
Do not be distracted by the things that are unclear. Do, but, do not be distracted by the things that we are not supposed to know. We are not God's prophetic experts. We are not God's defense attorneys. That's not our job. We are not God's public relations specialists. God can handle it. We are not God's social media influencers. Please, use, sh- use social media, but God, can, God got it handled. We are not God's chief executive officers trying to manage God. We should not pretend to be these things. God, Jesus could have used a slew of other words in this spot. In this moment when he's leaving, he could have described us in so many words, but he simply says, you will be my witnesses. What does that mean? We see it in the early church in Acts 4, 19, verse 20. Peter and John, they're pulled before the Sanhedrin. They're, they're under fire. They're facing heat. And what do they say? Whether it's right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. So, what have you seen and heard of God? What have you seen and heard of God? How have you experienced God? What are you a witness to about Jesus? It's gotta be personal. It's gotta be from your own experience, from your story. If you just tell me what someone else said about someone else, well, who cares about that? What have you seen and heard of God? And to make it a little bit more simple, perhaps, because we can think of big things in our lives, but what about this week? As I was looking back on this question, how am I a witness for Jesus this week? How have I seen Jesus at work this week? I thought of some moments this week. The first thing I I thought of um, were all the letters that you all wrote that were up here last, last weekend. Remember that? I love this. Someone said, I've got this, I've got you, God. I saw Jesus in, in those prayers that we created together. I saw Jesus there. I saw Jesus in, the, in those of you who went across the street to be part of the blood drive, literally giving your life, your life blood, so that others could have life. I saw Jesus there. I saw Jesus in our silent Sabbath experience, in the prayer room. It was beautiful for me. I saw Eleanor participating um, in one of the stations. In the mirror, we wrote, messages from God to us. I love you very much is what she wrote. Several of you wrote, your uniqueness is beautiful. I saw God, I saw Jesus in those messages that you wrote. I saw Jesus in this church coming out in the rain. The rain did not stop you. We came out to celebrate the life of Jesus. I saw Jesus in all the volunteers that helped. This is just a small group of volunteers. This is our social committee that that did the breakfast. So there's so many people who helped last weekend for four days with Jesus to celebrate. And I saw Jesus in you. This Thursday night, I went to the very first uh, one of this session of Grief Share. And you can, as Pastor Otis said, you can join anytime. I saw Jesus in the comfort expressed in that circle the support that was happening, the tears that were shed, the encouragement that happened. I saw Jesus in the community on Thursday night. What have you seen and heard of God? What have you seen and heard of God? This is why I love when we do our blogs and we can hear each other's stories because your story is gonna be different from everyone else's. Your story's gonna be different and your testimony matters. It makes a difference. Your words, the words of a witness, friends, the words of a witness can bring life or death. Witnesses are incredibly crucial and important to be a witness. We've been reminded of this, I've been reminded of this, the importance of being a witness and being a true witness through the work of the Innocence Project. Since 1989, when DNA evidence 
became available in 37 states. 375 people have been exonerated through DNA evidence. They were convicted and serving time. Friends, 60% of those exonerated are African American. Only 14% of the overall US population. So that is a pointer to the reality of racism that we face in, in, in our world today still. They served an average of 14 years. 29% involved false confessions. I was listening to a fascinating story on podcast about someone that confessed and, and, and claims not to have committed the crime and all the psychological aspects that go into false confessions and what that means. But guess what? 69% involved eyewitness misidentification. The words of a witness can bring life or the words of a witness can bring death. This is Glenn Simon's story. Glenn Simon. In 1974, he was only 22. On New Year's Eve of that year in Oklahoma, a couple men broke into a liquor store, and in the process, two women working there were shot. One woman died. The other woman was shot in the head, but survived. She was 18. When she was interviewed by the police, days later, she said she couldn't remember very much. She said she wouldn't be able to identify anyone because her eyes were focused on the guns and not on the people, and she got shot in the head. But eventually, she testified in court that Simmons was one of the two men. What the jury did not hear, what was not allowed into the court because of some bad uh, defense work and, and the one team not sharing the information with the other side, the jury did not hear that she misidentified or didn't identify or identified someone else nine times before identifying Simmons in court. Several witnesses on the other side testified that they had seen Harvey not even in Oklahoma. He claimed, I mean, um, Simmons, I'm sorry. They had seen Simmons. He wasn't even in Oklahoma that night. He was in Louisiana. Um, and. Several witnesses said that, but that was not um, weighed as highly as the, as the witness of the 18-year-old that had been shot. A private investigator located a report that she had identified other sus suspects and said considered her identifications overnight before deciding she was confident in them. That report was never shared with the defense attorneys. In December of 2023, after over 48 years in prison, Simmons was officially declared innocent by a judge. It's the longest wrongful conviction case in US history. 48 years in prison. The words of a witness can bring life. The words of a witness can bring death. This is a day we've been waiting for for a long, long time. It finally came. We can say justice was done today. Finally, he said, and I'm happy. I'm happy. This is a lesson in resilience and a lesson in, you know, tenacity and sticking with it. It's a lesson in faith and belief, you know, and hope, said Simmons. Simmons is now 70. He was 22 when this happened. He's 70 now, and sadly, he's facing stage four colon cancer. He's hoping for Oklahoma to compensate him to the max that they can right now. The law says a, a max of $175,000 compensation for 48 years in prison. Um, in the meantime, though, I see Jesus in the people. This is a GoFundMe campaign. $351,000.85 of people saying, we want to support this man that was wrongfully convicted. We want to help with his living and medical expenses. How different would Glenn's life have been today if the witnesses had been believed and the witnesses that was not sure would not have testified. The words of a witness is life and death. Jesus says, you are my witnesses. Your word matters. What you've seen and heard, your story, sharing that 
matters. It matters. As we close, I want to show you one more Ascension painting. This time from 1958 by Salvador Dali from Spain. It's a different perspective, isn't it? In it, there's a woman um, who looks almost like Mary. Um, it's his wife, Gala. The painter put his wife in the picture as the witness of Jesus. And you see Jesus there, and we see him from the bottom this time, his feet going up as it were, but that call, will you follow me? Will you be my witnesses? Will you see yourself in that picture? Will you paint yourself in the picture? Will you answer the call of Jesus? Will you be my witnesses? Amen.